our next speaker, Edna DeVore, is uh, from the SETI Institute. Uh, again, uh, old-time uh, idealists will know that I'm a great fan of uh, Carl Sagan's search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and in previous years we've had Jill Tarter, who's the director of SETI, and uh, I'm still hoping one of these years to have the great Frank Drake who's the author of The Drake Equation, which attempts to speculate about the possibility of other life out there. I'm hoping to get him to grace our stage. But uh, in the meantime, I'm very lucky to have had Edna DeVore agree to appear today. Uh, she's the Director of Education at SETI and is specifically responsible for conveying information about the Kepler. Is that right? Yes, thank you very much. Right. I'm this honored is to be here. Edna, thank Edna you. DeVore. Thank you, Moses. Well, like many of the women that have talked to you, I feel like I've come a long way from my roots. I was a little girl raised on a cattle ranch in a town of 40 people in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. And it's a long way to go from a country home to outer space, but that's the journey that I've been able to make. And I'm uh, personally amazed every time I sort of think back to my roots, and yet, um, I believe that anybody who can dream can make that kind of adventure and could go to those sorts of places. And so today what I'd like to share with you is some thoughts about searching for life in space and about specifically NASA's Kepler mission. I'm one of a team of people. I'm one of the two co-investigators or co-leads for education and public outreach for this mission. I'm also an astronomer. I was a planetarium director. I was a high school teacher, I was a college teacher. I've had kind of an adventure along the way. And it's always been something where when a new project presented itself that was exciting and took me closer to space, I went there. And I think my sense of being enamored of space started when I was 10. And my father took me outside to show me Sputnik going across the sky. And so in my lifetime, we've gone from being earthbound to getting our toes into space and walking on the moon. And I know that many of the people that I have grown up with and I continue to work with would be delighted to raise their hand and go to Mars. And so it's a very special and adventuresome time to be alive. And they tell me if I push this button, <laughs> the next picture will come up. There we go. So that's the title of my talk and my titles. Um, but I'd like you to imagine for a moment that you're out under the darkest, starriest, blackest sky that you can see. And if you were, and you were way out in the country and there were no street lights and no glow of Toronto and all five million people in the distance, you might be able to see as many as three or 4,000 stars with the naked eye. Now, if you want to do a little more extension, we all got warmed up here. If you could hold a grain of sand in your hand, imagine that, put your hand up and hold a grain of sand between your fingers. That's the field of view of the Hubble Space Telescope. That's how much of the sky it sees at a time. And this photograph is a little piece of one of those grains of sand. It's called the Hubble Deep Field. And with the exception of a couple of well, actually, in this one, I only see two sort of bright objects with spikes on them. Those are nearby stars. Every other image in that picture is another galaxy of at least 100 billion stars. We live in an object like that. We know of at least 100 billion stars in our own galaxy. And we think this is what our galaxy looks like. This is a graphic image. We can't hop in a spaceship and fly far, far away and turn around and take that snapshot. Remember, we haven't even gotten to Mars yet. And that's where the sun is located. And in the vicinity of the sun, in the last 12 to 15 years, we've started to discover that our solar system is not alone. I looked it up this morning because it's always changing. Right now, astronomers have discovered, as of today, 461 planets in orbit around other stars. 
So we know about at least 400 other solar systems. We have yet to find one that's like ours. We have yet to find one that really has a comfortable little home that ET could live in, okay? And that's what the NASA Kepler mission is all about. It was launched about 15 months ago. I got to go watch the launch, that was such a hoot. It was at night, and it streamed up into the sky, and about a minute and a half after launch, there was this tiny white speck from the main rocket engine, and all the boosters had fired, and then they fell away into the ocean like rubies falling from a diamond in the sky because they were little red spots falling down to the ocean. If you ever get to go watch a launch, do it. Kepler asked the question, are there other worlds like the Earth? That's the fundamental science goal of this mission. Well, it's the fundamental science goal of a lot of SETI research, too. Is there a good place for life elsewhere in the universe? Is there a water world that we could find life on? And so here's the official statement from the mission. We seek evidence of Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone of sun-like stars. How many people in here have ever taken an astronomy class? Oh, lots of astronomers. That's a big, bigger number than usual. Super. Any amateur astronomers in the room? A couple. Well, you know, amateur astronomers are just unpaid professionals most of the time. <laughs> but amateur astronomers offer a great deal to the search for extrasolar planets. There are amateur astronomers who are participating in Earth-based missions now, helping professional astronomers find planets. And we named our mission for a guy who knew a lot about planets, Johannes Kepler. He lived 400 years ago and discovered from data the first laws of planetary motion and published those, and those are Kepler's three laws, and most seventh graders have to learn those. And those are not chopsticks, those are dividers. Kids always ask me if those are chopsticks. <laughs> he was a mathematician and loved geometry. So what's a planet? What are we really looking for? This is a pretty good scale drawing of the planets in our solar system. You'll notice there's only eight in the top row. Pluto has been demoted to being a dwarf planet. There's a guy named Mike Brown out at Caltech who keeps finding more and more of those. So it's probably a good third category of planets. Most of the planets that have so far been discovered are these big ones. The Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune-sized planets. They're big gaseous planets, big icy planets. Maybe their moons would be a cool place to live, but the planets, uh, not so much. Kepler's looking for little ones, like the Earth and Mars and Venus. And we can't find those from the surface of the Earth, so we went to space. So how big is the Earth in comparison to a star? Here's our star, the Sun, seen through a filter. And if you look really carefully up there, you can see the Earth is this teeny white speck here. It would take about 110 Earths lined up side by side to cross the Sun. And so we're looking for something that's really quite small. What kind of a star is the sun? It's kind of middle-sized, middle-aged, not too hot, not too cold, halfway through its life. Hopefully, that's what I am. Um, I'm the rest of that. And we're actually looking for stars that are like the sun, and we're looking for planets in the zone around those stars that's called the habitable zone. It's otherwise known as the Goldilocks zone, because when we think about our, old, our own solar systems, we have three planets that are close to the habitable zone. Venus, the Earth, and Mars. Venus is too hot, Mars is too cold, and the Earth is just right, just like the bowls of porridge. And so we are looking for planets in this habitable zone, and if we have a brighter, hotter star, the habitable zone is farther out. If we have a dimmer, cooler star, it's farther in. And so the odds, we have to understand the stars that we look at, even if we find planets around them, to understand whether they're habitable. I'm watching the clock over here. So this is our telescope for all of those who love technology. The primary mirror is about 1.4 meters in diameter. That's about four foot eight, okay? But this is a wide field telescope. Instead of that grain of sand, now you need to hold up both of your hands like this to cover the piece of sky that Kepler is searching. Simultaneously, we have four and a half million stars in our field of view. And from those, we've picked about 150,000, oh, maybe 160,000 to bring the data down. The rest of it, we don't bring down. There's competition for downlink time. Um, the instrument, there's um, a, a cutaway picture of it. The main thing to, to learn from these kind of techie, techie slides is that we have a three and a half year mission 
because the way that we are looking for planets is we are looking for the planet when it crosses in front of its star. And if the planet is on a one-year orbit, we'll see it the first time, and we wait another year to see it the second time, and we wait a third year to see it the third time, and we want three transits, three of these crossings, to say that we've actually found a planet with the same year length and the same dip in the light when the planet goes by. And so if we want to find an Earth, we've got to watch the same star for at least three and a half years. So we watch a whole lot of stars at the same time because we don't know which ones will have transits. And there's our camera. It's a 96 megapixel camera. Every six seconds, it takes 96 megapixels. And then out of that, we take little postage stamps of data and store them on an onboard computer, and once a month, we get to dump it down to Earth. And I'd love it if we could make solar systems that were as efficient as these CCD chips. They turn 96% of the photons, the energy that hit them, into a signal, an electron. Trouble is, they're a lot more expensive than what you can put on top of your house. I think the breakthrough will come in solar energy when we figure out how to take that technology and make it on Xerox machines and stick it on our roofs. I really think that there's some crossover to be had. This is the spacecraft when it was under construction. Size-wise, it's vertically. On the, on the left-hand side, you see the telescope. It's about the size of an ice cream truck. It's about nine feet in diameter and 15 feet long. Tried to come up with something that people could identify with. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we're looking. That CCD pattern on the sky is right in the summer triangle. It's not square on the Milky Way because there's too many stars. There'd be too many stars behind and in front of others. And so if you can find the summer triangle this summer, and it should be right square up over your head here this summer, then you'll be able to put your two hands up and cover up the area of the sky where we're looking for Earth's. First light image with all the 450 million stars. Trace 2 was a planet found from the Earth. The other thing is a star cluster. We'll just skip that one. So here's the first planets that were announced by Kepler. These came from about the first 10 days of observation. And you'll notice these are all pretty big because that bottom row of numbers, 4.3, 18.8, 15, 16, and 18, that's the dimension of that planet in Earth radii. So the one on the left is the most interesting because it's only four times the radius of the Earth. The others are all larger than Jupiter. And they all have really short orbits. A matter of a few days, they whip around their stars. Now, we'd already discovered a lot of planets like that in those other 461 found from the ground. These are very hot planets. They're not good places to live. We don't know what they look like because we don't take photographs. We only measure the light and the dip in the light. It's called photometry. It's like we've put a giant light meter in space. So I, I look at these as the jelly bean planets. There's a yellow one and a blue one and so on. Um, but again, they're not very good places to live. If you compare them with the planets where we know, that we know things about in our own solar system, you can see that the Earth is down there between the freezing and the boiling point of water, that habitable zone planet. Yet, Jupiter and Neptune are colder than frozen water at the surface of their clouds. Lead melts at some temperature below the temperature of Venus. So the surface of Venus is not a very good place to live either. Um, these other planets, it could rain gold, or lead, easily, or molten lava, or iron. So what we have demonstrated, and these were announced last January, what we demonstrated by finding these is that the equipment is all working just fine, thank you very much, and we're finding planets like the ones that can be found from the ground by an entirely different method. Yesterday, June the 15th, the Kepler mission released the first 43 days of data from this mission to the public. They're on the multi-wavelength archive at the Space Telescope Science Institute. It's a bit of a trick to get to them because they're released really for the astronomy types, but there's 156,000 stars worth of data out there, and buried in those 156,000 stars are 500 planetary candidates that we have yet to either say, this is a planet, or this is a star spot, or this is a grazing binary star system where we just 
clip the top of one of the other as they go around. There are false positives that look like planets and those have to be disproved. But if you're eager to go find your own planet in the Kepler data, there's 500 candidates right there that you can go look for. You can go home tonight, tune in, learn how to deal with FITS files. They give everybody FITS. And um, look for a planet. And a quarter from now, another batch of data will come out because under NASA regulations, the data is held for a year and then it is released to the public and it's been partly processed, but it's there. And one of the really wonderful things about this is that for general stellar astronomers, there are people who make a living studying stars. I'm one of them, amazingly enough, for a cowgirl. Um, and for stellar astronomers, this is the best data that has ever been obtained for binary stars and flare stars and our, our Lyra stars and all these other kinds of subcategories of stars whose light varies because they do this physically or because they're orbiting each other or other kind of phenomena is going on. The binary star people that work on this mission say we're gonna have to throw out the old textbooks and start over again with the new data. And that was not even the true purpose of the mission. Remember, the true purpose was to find another home like ours, a planet with water on its surface. And I'm confident that over the next couple of years, that's what we'll find. We're looking for a planet down there in that little green stripe zone where the Earth is sitting. And all those other yellow dots and all of those other red dots are planets that we so far know about. But none of them are in the green zone except our own Earth. So the big question is, is the Earth rare? Or is it common, which is one step toward that bigger opportunity to understand whether life on our planet is incredibly rare and precious, which I believe it's incredibly precious. I don't know if it's incredibly rare. And so that's what science can help us understand. I don't think that science can tell us why the universe exists. The people this morning were more of the message of why the universe might exist and why we might all exist. It can tell us how we exist. It can tell us a great deal about the natural and the physical world, but it won't tell us everything. Yet, when we obtain a perspective on our own planet, it seems to make a huge difference. I'd like to close with a few thoughts on this photograph of the Earth. I think that's the ultimate iconic photograph of the last century because that photograph started the environmental movement. That photograph gave us a vision of where we live and who we are. And you can't see any borders on that photograph. We're all one people in this world and we're all one people on this tiny planet. And even when somebody says, Edna, astronomy is so impractical. Why are you doing that? It's because I love the perspective that it gives us on our role and our place in the universe, and it gives us a way to stand back and take a breath and say, what's really important and how can we care for our planet and our place in the universe? And so um, I'd like to invite you to learn more about what we do. You can do that at the SETI Institute website, the Kepler website. And if you'd really love to hear Frank Drake speak, which is what this was kicked off with, was that Moses said he really wanted to get him to to come to this thing, and I'm sure that Frank will come at some time. The SETI Institute, for the very first time, is hosting SETICon in August in California. It's a great reason to come to California and rub elbows with all kinds of people that are searching for life in the universe. Thank you very much. Splendid, mm. Edna. I love that. I love that. Thank you. And, and would you would you pass on my thanks to Karen Randall for yes, putting us in touch? And, I will. You know, we invited her here, but yes. for some reason she couldn't come. That's right. I will. Yeah. All okay, right. Okay. Thank so, you. So let's have our shot. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, thank Moses. You.